in this class. What would interest us is, is um, you know, how do you, I mean, this is a very awkward shape, this big metal hoop. How do you constrain it so that it, it can't move in any way except the nice rotation around the, the patient, okay? Well, what they use here, you can see, this is actually a photo. This is actually from Alex Slocum's uh, lab, I believe, way back when I was a grad student, I took this picture. Um, and, and I believe he designed, uh, designed the bearings for this. And uh, you can see down here, uh, you know, there's wheels that, are, that this thing rides on, and there's wheels up, up here. But I'm going to show a cat of this a little clearer. Okay, so, but first of all, what is the wheel to flat interaction? Well, obviously, the, the only thing that satisfies both the conditions, you know, if you think of all the blue lines that come normal to that flat stage, it's a box. If you think of all the blue lines that come out of this, it's certainly not a box. But the only thing that's common with that box is this single line. So it's basically like a wire, okay? Um, but the nice thing about a wheel is it, it can, it can uh, you know, rotate as well and push this guy through, okay? But basically the interaction there can be modeled as, a, as like a wire flexure. And so now let's look at this. This is the CAD. Here's the ring. It's essentially an octagon. Um, it, it, the real ring is not a regular octagon, but I've, I've catted it as a regular octagon where all the sides are the same size. Okay, so you take an octagon and extrude it in a, in a big circle like this, and you get the hoop, okay? And, uh, at, and, you know, at the top, this one's the easiest one on the two sides, you have it pinned like this, and the constraint is, is a wire. Now, it's already over-constrained when you put one on the other side. They're doing the same thing. It's redundant. It's like two wires on both sides. But in reality, it's necessary because this joint would, this would just collapse one way or another. It would just fall over, right? And so um, you kind of need to pinch it um, to, to, to constrain it so it behaves as, if, as, it, as it should, right? And so, but then on this side, you have four wheels, two on this side. Again, this, this one's over constraining this one and vice versa. And this one's over constraining this one and vice versa. But, and I suppose from gravity, you wouldn't necessarily need these top two. So you could save money etc., you know, and, and remove these, and gravity could preload it down onto just those guys, and that might be less friction and less over-constraint stuff. But um, just to be safer, we, we don't need it to be that precise. We don't need it to be, uh, you know, that, uh, that rigorous. Um, and, and it's just a better design to pinch it, so there's no way this guy's coming out. Um, that would be really bad if it just fell out if someone tried to lift the hoop and it just popped out. Um, so, so what he did is decided to put two things on both sides, right? And so basically what this is is basically a constraint, you know, constraint lines that go like this, and there's one set here and one set here. So let's see what the constraint space would be, the, the relationship between all those blue lines. Okay, so you can see this blue line up here comes out like that, and these two cross blue lines go there, and these two cross blue lines go there, and you can see these two lie on a plane, these two lie on a plane, and those intersect at this thing, and this one lies on this plane. So sure enough, um, we have one, two, three, four, five blue lines that all lie on intersecting parallel, or sorry, that all lie on intersecting planes that intersect at this red rotation line. You can see how this red line satisfies the rule of complement patterns. It intersects this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here, and this one at it, that one at infinity. So that is indeed the red rotation. Its constraint space, you know, as you know, is a bunch of intersecting blue lines. Because this has one degree of freedom, six minus one is five, so you need to pick five. And surely enough, he did pick five. So it's pretty darn as close to exactly constrained as possible for high precision. And yet, uh, he over-constrained it with this just so you don't break, you know, with, with opposing wheels so you don't break, uh, you know, joints and the thing falls apart, right? So it's a very nice design, okay? All right. Um, okay, and, and the wheels are oriented so it can rotate over large ranges without scratching or having friction. It just reduces the friction, right? So, so you can see how these principles of fact and constraint design can be used to design rigid systems as well, okay? So another precision thing you guys absolutely have to know about um, in a class about precision uh, that isn't compliant, but, but I suppose could be made compliant, I'll tell you how, are, are kinematic couplings, okay? Kinematic couplings are a great uh, machine element that um, you should know about, okay? If you're ever going to do anything practical dealing with precision. And what they're used for is like imagine, imagine you have, um, like, like say, say you have a sample that you're looking at under a microscope stuck to some body, right? And uh, 
you know, say you spend all day finding the sample in the, the microscope is zoomed in really small. Say so you see a little cell on the, the, the you know, the slide or whatever, um, and you can see it. And then, and then you take, you, you want to take the, the cover slip, the slide off, and go do something to the cell and then put it back under and see it again. Well, if you, if you just do that and you just put it back in, put the slide in, then you'll spend a whole other day looking for it, right? Because it's not going to go right back to where it, it was. The, the question is how repeatably can you take a slide, move it off, and then put it back and have it be in the exact same place? Well, not very high precision if you're just grabbing a cover slip and putting it in there, right? So you spend all day refinding the cell. But um, if you had this attached, the, the, you know, the, the, the cover slip there, the, the glass slide that the cell is on, attached to a kinematic coupling, which is basically a big rigid body with, um, you know, six, or sorry, three spheres going into three grooves, okay, then you get very high precision and repeatability. What, what you can do is you can take this whole thing off, take it somewhere, do whatever you want to it, and then click it back in the grooves, and it will, with very high precision, put everything back to exactly where it was in the first place. Okay. Now there's different kinds of kinematic couplings. There's Kelvin style. There's there's other there's other 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 styles of kinematic couplings. But but um, uh, this is the most common and the most symmetric design, where you've got this V groove and the spheres go in it, um, and uh, right when they touch down in it, that they make crosses here that are independent blue lines. And if you have you know, you know, three pairs of those crosses, one, two, three, when you set them all in, you have six single blue line points that satisfy those conditions. Again, this is the only blue line that is normal to this surface and this surface that's shared by both. And so this is the only blue line, that's the only blue line. So you have six blue lines. So when you set it in, it is totally exactly constrained, right? There's, you know, six independent blue lines make for no degree of freedom, so it's not going to move when you set it in, which is exactly what, what you want. You don't want it to move, but you want them to be totally exactly constrained. Okay, you want there to be no degrees of freedom there, and and yet you want it. To, you know, it's it's not over constrained. For a rigid mechanism, this is the closest you can come to not over constraining something. And so, because it's not over constrained or redundantly constrained. Um, it's exactly constrained, or it's in this case totally exactly constrained, then it doesn't, you know, it has the highest precision you can get, which means you could just take that, take it off, put it back, take it off, put it back many times, and in a very repeatable way, it will, uh, you know, position, it will put it back to the exact same place every time. Now, it's of course not the exact same place, it just is better precision than you just picking up the slide and sticking it back by hand. Um, you know, Legos actually have pretty good precision too. If you take them off and stick them back on Legos, Legos have such impressive tolerance uh, that they they get very high repeatability as well. You can increase the repeatability of these, by the way, if you lubricate them. You know, in, in precision shops where they use these things, you'll see some of the some of the guys take these and like rub it on their hair because natural human hair grease. It's actually a really great lubricant that increases the precision of these. And you'll find when they're fresh, they kind of need to be broken in. If you cycle these many times, um, it'll, it'll start settling into something that's a little more repeatable. Um, and uh, you can also increase the precision by putting kind of flexures in the walls of these grooves uh, to use the repeatability of deformation. Uh, so you can improve the, again, by adding compliance, you can improve elastic uh, compliance, right? You, you can um, improve the repeatability of kinematic couplings, okay? So that, that's just something you should know about if you ever want to move something and repeatably put it back in its place and try and get it in the exact same spot, okay? Okay, so, um, all right, uh, all right, so, yeah. So, so now let's just do a little exercise. Say we removed this ball and we just had those two fitting in that slot. Okay, and I set it in there. Um, I set the stage on top there. What would its freedom space be? Well, if I set it down, just imagine it's set down, there would be these gr blue lines and those blue lines, but there wouldn't be those blue lines because we, remember we got rid of the ball, okay, for our example. Okay, so can you find all the red lines and intersect all the blue lines somewhere at least once? Okay, well, if you stare at that, you might. Um, 
you know, that's, uh, using the rule of comparing patterns, that's a great way to do it. Um, you could draw a red line right up here. Oh, well, actually, sorry. We could draw a red line through there. That intersects this guy here, this guy there, this guy here, and this guy there. And you could imagine that would correspond to a rocking rotation motion of the stage that you could visualize, and it would, it would kind of rotate the stage up about that axis, okay? The other one is the one I just showed, which is these, these lie on a plane, those lie on a plane, that's the intersection of those two planes. So you could imagine the balls would, the stage would rotate around this axis as this ball translates that way and that goes like that. So they go opposite, the, the stage would kind of rotate around that axis. So those are the two degrees of freedom. Remember, you got four uh, independent constraints. Six minus four is two, so you'd expect these two degrees of freedom. Then, of course, you could have all the screws in the um, cylindroid that this freedom space would make. These are two extreme generators that are skew on a, on a cylindroid, and uh, they'd make a bunch of screws as, as well, right? So, so that's just an example exercise to show you how you could think of kinematic couplings with freedom constraint spaces. So, um, and, of course, here is the cylindroid that I was talking about. You have to orient it differently, and then here's the constraint space, obviously, and uh, it would have four independent things in it, okay? Okay, great. So with that, um, that covers all the material up to the first exam. Um, we'll do, you know, exam review and questions in office hours. Uh, we don't have s slides on that, but um, uh, now you guys are experts in, like I said, um, analyzing and designing uh, parallel systems, both rigid and compliant where you have two rigid bodies connected directly together by wires, blades, uh, any other flexible spring geometry, and any uh, rigid surface-to-surface -surface contact, including if you think about magnetic and air bearings, I, I, I implied uh, earlier, uh, those have constraint directions, and, and it's not difficult to figure out how you would model those with constraint spaces either. So, so you can now uh, model and analyze the most complex joints that could ever be uh, visualized uh, and, and know all the ways they could move and, and know whether they're over constrained or exactly constrained, okay? And, and you have some principles about, oh, remember, parallel systems don't have anything to do with under constraint or not under constraint. That'll be when we talk about serial systems, which is next. So for that, um, thanks for watching and we'll tune in to the next lecture.